ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು we are on the second chapter the topic of karma yoga how to spiritualize and why should we spiritualize our daily actions that is starting before i start i, w- I want to share something uh funny i saw today you know these courts they put on these electronic sign boards on the on the roads so today i was walking down um um on uh, amsterdam and uh, on, on broadway actually and and i saw a sign which said uh, you need to know the context people keep asking me uh, which is better um, california or new york <laughs> because i was in california for one year before i came here so people both in hollywood and here they keep asking me which one do you like more which is better which is better so i saw this quote today it says um i believe that living in california adds 10 years to a man's life and i would spend those 10 years in new york <laughs> <laughs> so that's a nice answer <laughs> uh verse number 45 please repeat after me trigunya vishaya veda ತ್ರೈಗುಣ್ಯೋಭವಾರ್ಜುನಾಗುಣ್ಯೋಭವಾರ್ಜುನಾಕ್ಷೇಮ ಆತ್ಮವಾನ್ ನಿರ್ಯೋಗಕ್ಷೇಮ ಆತ್ಮವಾನ್ the vedas deal with subjects which are within the three gunas of prakriti so o arjuna you try to go beyond the three gunas be free of the dualities be established in sattva um rise above the the pursuit of acquisition of of material goods or preserving material goods and be self aware so this is the meaning of the verse religion is uh, of two categories what i'd like to call the lower religion or the mass religion and the higher religion which we call spirituality what is the lower religion so called lower religion that's most of what what goes under the flag of religion i want to satisfy my desires i want a good life in this world and god will help me do it religion will help me do it so the temples and churches and other places of worship are full of people who want to use god as a convenience nothing wrong in that because sri krishna here in the gita also will say later that my devotees are of four kinds there are those who want god those who actually have realized god they are also devotees but also those who want to satisfy their desires they also believe in god they pray to god so a good deal of prayer and um, uh, religious activity is for having a good life here and nothing wrong in that so that is what uh, i would like to call the lower religion why the lower religion where god is used to improve enhance my life here i have so many things which help me to make my life better a washing machine makes my life better a public transport makes my life better um amazon makes my life better and um gluten free makes my life better and god also makes my life better so god is useful for me and the problem with that is sometimes um if it doesn't work i pray you, you you hear this so many times i prayed and prayed and prayed it didn't work so i don't believe in all that god so god has been fired god didn't perform laid off that's one kind of religion and again it's better than having no religion at all but there is a higher kind of religion which one must move on to ultimately one must the whole point of even the lower kind of religion is one must graduate to the higher religion which is that of a spiritual seeker 
the big questions. Does God really exist? Does, um, can I experience God? What happens after death? How can I overcome suffering? Is it possible to permanently, totally overcome suffering? To rise above the, human, the limitations of the human condition? So these great questions, the quest for nirvana, moksha, salvation, God-realization, the, the ultimate quest, the ultimate spiritual advent, adventure, that is the higher religion. The difference is this, in the higher religion, in spirituality, one no longer uses God as a convenience. Not God for my life, rather my life for God. God for my life is the lower kind of religion, the mass religion. But my life is for realizing God. God realization is the purpose of my life. Moksha is the purpose of my life. Then it, you have graduated to the higher religion. And congratulations, you must have, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, so there's a difference there really is a difference people who come here or, or to any kind of this, uh, spiritual quest you know this is different from the masses who go to um, church or temple I remember once I went to an old one of the older Hindu temples here and um, so first we went to the temple I was going to give a talk on Vedanta here means in USA uh, I was going to give a talk on Vedanta, but first we went to the temple to bow down before the deity there. And I saw so many people. It was a Sunday. So there were literally hundreds of people, Indian people there, um, who had come. They were offering puja and prayers and everything. So I expected, oh, there's going to be a big crowd in the, in the uh, Vedanta talk. When I went down to the lecture hall, there were about 20 people sitting there. And half of them were on their phones. <laughs> what happened? This is the distinction. I should have expected it. The distinction between those people, they are religious folk, but they are not here for moksha, liberation, um, uh, enlightenment, um, the big questions. No, no, no. They are here that um, let my health be fine and let um, me not be laid off, let my uh, children do well. Or no, even if there is no specific desire, mostly people go offer pujas, pray to God, let things go well. And that's fine. That's fine as a prayer. One, one should have that prayer. It's a good thing. But if that's the end of it, then that's the lower religion. Those who are spiritual seekers, can we not pray for things to be fine? We can. We can. But that's not our primary purpose. We can certainly pray. Things should go well. Why not? If things don't go well, my spiritual quest will be disturbed. But that is not my primary purpose. The distinction is this. When, when Narain, later Vivekananda, prayed to Sri Ramakrishna for something material, his widowed mother and his younger brothers and sisters were on the verge of starvation. He didn't have a job. And he was on a high spiritual quest. But what about his family? They, they were in trouble. So he pl prayed to Sri Ramakrishna, let, them, let their poverty be removed, let them do well. So that could you ask the Divine Mother? You know the whole story, I'm not going into that. But the final solution given by Sri Ramakrishna is interesting. He said, finally, he yielded. At first he said, I don't ask for such things from God. But finally he said, all right. They, that means your mother and your brothers and sisters, will not lack plain food and clothing. That much. So it will not disturb your spiritual life. But he didn't say they're going to become millionaires or something like that. Now, why am I saying this? Here, Sri Krishna says, the Vedas, by which he means the Karmakanda of the Vedas. In the Vedas, in the scriptures also, you find these two kinds of religion. Karmakanda and Jnanakanda. Karmakanda, the ritualistic portion. Kanda means portion. The ritualistic portion and the uh, knowledge portion, Jnanakanda. The ritualistic portion is for uh, the mass religion, the lower religion. You want to fulfill desires here in this life or in the afterlife, want to go to heaven and all of that. Then the karma kanda is for you. And Sri Krishna says that portion of the Vedas is all about, is materialistic. It's all about the three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas. The prakriti, nature, is composed of the three gunas. Um, I will not go into what, are the, what the gunas are. We are familiar with the terms. Basically material nature. So, this world and worlds after death, none of them are spiritual. 
I want to be happy here and hereafter. That's what the ritualistic portion of the Vedas are. They prescribe various rituals. You want children, you want to uh, defeat your enemies, you want to have wealth, you want to have a kingdom or things like that. Or after death you want to go to some high heaven um, in the company of the gods. and uh, All of that the Vedas promise we can give you. But that they are not permanent. They are all materialistic within, within uh, nature. Spiritual starts with the Upanishads, with the Jnana Kanda. So what Sri Krishna is telling Arjuna here is the lower portion of the Vedas, the Karma Kanda deals with the three Gunas. But you are a spiritual seeker. Transcend that. Transcend the three Gunas. He says, for you then, the higher portion of the Vedas, the Jnana Kanda, which the Bhagavad Gita is based upon. Your, the teaching I will give you is different. And you have to go beyond um, that kind of religion. Why would the Vedas or any religion, if, if that is not the highest form, not the highest teaching, why would they even show you how to fulfill worldly desires? Worldly desires? Why would the Vedas even teach that and show you ways to fulfill it? Because we want it. And if, if religion does not help us to get it in an ethical, sustainable, good way, we will become immoral and try to get it in immoral ways, which leads to extended and extensive suffering. So to help us to gradually grow in religion, what it does, the Vedas do is that they prescribe Vedic rituals and a moral way of life. So if you want to fulfill your desires, you will get money, you will get success, you will get wealth, you will have children, you will have, go to heaven. All of that is possible. But now you must follow this kind of a lifestyle which is uh, disciplined, uh, which you must not do immoral things. And you must be religious and you know uh, do the, the fire sacrifices, things like that which are prescribed in the Vedas. They slowly generate and build up morality and ethical lifestyle. With the hope that ultimately we will transcend and come to what the Vedas really want to teach. Which is the teachings of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. It's there right now. It's not that some ancient time uh, the Vedic fire rituals which seem obsolete to us. Right now also. Nowadays it goes under the name of you know, things like positive psychology. Or in Christianity they say something called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel that Jesus wants you to be rich. No, he doesn't. <laughs> I'm sorry, but he doesn't. It, that's one of the biggest curses that a religious teacher would want you to. It's not bad to be rich, but that's not the point. Um, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, uh, he, there's an interesting quote attributed to him. When he was teaching transcendental meditation here, he started off in New York, I think. Um, near New York, the, the Woodst Woodstock? Woodstock? Woodstock, yes. Bethel, New York. Yes. Um, so he started off there, at least he became famous there, and what ultimately became transcendental meditation. And nowadays it's a big thing in the, in the United States, in Europe. It uh, is used to manage stress. They say it even boosts um, immu the immunity system, things like that. And their papers have been written about the benefits. And they're all worldly benefits. None of, them, none of the papers are about how it gives you enlightenment um, of transcendental meditation. It seems that somebody asked Maharshi Mahesh Yogi back in India, when he, in the early days when he went back to India, they asked him, monks, what is this you're doing? These techniques are meant for self-knowledge, for realization. Not for um, stress management or looking young or removing wrinkles from your face, things like that. Um, they may have those benefits, but that's not the point. His answer was very interesting. He said, and very much Vedic in spirit actually, he said, I give them what they want so that they will want what I want to give them. I give them what they want, so that, that's the hope, that so that they will want what I want to give them. So I want to give them what? Higher spirituality. But the student has to be ready, they have to want it. 
and that wanting will come when the lower wants are satisfied to some extent some kind of faith is developed that yes in this path uh, something higher is possible it works if it works for my um, it fulfills my worldly necessities maybe what they are saying about higher spirituality is also true that's what sri krishna says here trigunya vishaya veda here veda means the lower part of the vedas the karma kanda they deal with the three gunas nistrai gunyo bhava arjuna o arjuna go beyond the three gunas that means go beyond material nature how how do you go beyond material nature nirdwandva nirdwandva means the dualities pleasure and pain heat and cold honor and dishonor success and failure the dualities which which in in the ocean of which we float in life at this at one moment floating up and at another moment going down and we are forever struggling with that if you are struggling with that all the time one cannot be spiritual one must at one point let it be let life stream carry you it, it uh, you float on the stream of life don't struggle with it rather use your energies for for the higher purpose of spiritual realization dwandva means dualities normally we are always fighting against this we're trying to uh, overcome that which is unpleasant and trying to get that which is pleasant that must stop that is the sign of the lower life the higher spiritual life starts when we transcend when we are able to ignore put up with the vagaries of life what is the phrase a curved ball life throws at you a curved ball so um put up with it in vedanta it is called titiksha a spiritual fortitude a little toughness this word nidwandva rising above the dualities of life pleasure and pain misery um, uh, honor and dishonor sometimes success sometimes failure not being overwhelmed by uh, failure not being swept away by success serene and calm and balanced in both not being um desperate in in misery and in pain um not feeling too secure and you know on top of the world things are all right fine only because right now things are going fine for me so that calmness that serenity that is called nirdwandva in fact in the 15th chapter in the 7th chapter actually i've got two verses 27th verse and 28th verse 7th chapter it says icha dvesha samuthena dwandva mohena bharata sarva bhutani sammoham sarge yanti parantapa so as we are created and we created means as we get these bodies universe is created we have these bodies and our past karma starts giving results immediately we get caught up in the the dualities and the things which are pleasant we want them things which are unpleasant which we want to get away from them what happens is as bodies are created i the the jivatman the individual being when i i find myself embodied things which are um pleasant for this body i want them things which are unpleasant for this body i want to get rid of that this is the dwandva the root of the dwandva and it starts at the moment of embodiment and then how do you get out of it the 28th verse says yesham twantagatam papam jananam punya karmanam te dwandva moha nir nirmukta bhajante mam tridhavrata by devotion to god nishkama bhakti devotion without any desire worldly desire what happens is with the purified mind impurities in the mind are wiped out the purified mind dwandva moha nirmukta one rises above the delusion caused by the dwandva the dualities that is freedom that is moksha so the word dwandva is it is the duality is used to define what is bondage and what is freedom here you see again in the 15th chapter 
There's a very beautiful verse. Fifth verse, 15th chapter, fifth verse, where the same concept of Dvandva comes. It's like this. Nirmana moha jita sanga dosha adhyatma vit nitya vinivreta kama dvandeir vimukta sukha dukha sangair gachantya mudha padamabhyayam tat. Enlightenment, freedom, moksha. How is it? What's it like? So it says, Nirmana moha, liberated from uh, egotism and delusion, Jita Sangha Dosha, transcending all attachments, Adhyatmanitva, ever established in the pure consciousness within. I am the I am pure consciousness. Vinivritta Kama, forever desires have, have fled from this one, forever. Dvandveir Vimukta, uh, free from the dualities. The dualities keep coming, this one is not affected by it. Sukha Dukkha Sangha, so the, the Pleasure and pain, the duality set up by pleasure and pain, this one has transcended. This amuraha, the non-deluded one, muda means a foolish one, ignorant one. Amuda means who has overcome uh, ignorance. This one, gachanti padam abhyayam tat, goes to that, that, uh, that, that state of, that undecaying state, that a uh, changeless state, that, that eternal state, attains to that eter- eternal state. Which is our reality, a Brahman. So, the word Dvandva. Nitya Sattvastha. Different meanings can be given. These are the, the ways to at- attain, to go beyond the three gunas. So, one is to go beyond the Dvandvas, be serene and s- strong when the waves of ups and downs come in life. Don't be swept away. Second, uh, Nitya Sattvastva, one meaning given by a commentator here is um, Dhairyam Avalambya, be patient. There is no quality like patience. Sri Ramakrishna says, patience, 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 or forbearance, forbearance, forbearance. In Bengali he said, Sha, Sha, Sha. Uh, it's a play on words. The three letters, they sound the same in, in Bengali. The Sanskrit, Sa, Sha, Sha. The sound sha 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 in Bengali, and one meaning of sha is to forbear. In um, Hindi, sahan karna, sahana. So to forbear, um, and then he says in Bengali, je shay she roy, je na shay tar na shay. It's a play. It's a pun. He was very good at pun. But think, the, what is punny in Bengali? I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what is uh, what is? Uh, it doesn't work so well in English. So I just have to. Uh, explain it. The one who forbears, that one survives, that one stays. The one who does not forbear um, is destroyed or is finished. So I said it doesn't really work in English, <laughs> the pun. So forbearance. Why is it sattvastha? See, one of the qualities of sattva guna, the quality of lightness, serenity, is patience. The the tamasic person doesn't even make an effort. The rajasic person is restless. Uh, makes effort but gives up too fast. Moves on too fast. It is the uh, sattvic person who can hold on. Who can persist. Nir yoga kshema atma van. Each, w- verse, each word is so important. But luckily they'll all be explained so on o- over the next 18 chapters. Nir Yoga Kshema means here Yoga Kshema, free of Yoga and Kshema. What does Yoga mean? What does Kshema mean? Yoga does not mean the uh, stretching in yoga pants. That's different. <laughs> it does not mean meditation. It does not mean um, Bhakti or, or Karma Yoga. No, no, none of them. Here Yoga means Apraptasya Prapti. The yoga literally means joining. The original root meaning of Yoga is used here. The root meaning of Yoga is twofold. One of the root meanings of yoga is meditation. Yud samadho in Sanskrit grammar. Another meaning of yoga is yujir yoga, to join, to connect two things. So when we want something, we want that thing should be joined to me. Let me be joined with um, the latest iPhone, things like that. So that is yoga. That means 
things which I do not have, that should come to me. And shema means to protect, to preserve that which I already have. So let my earlier iPhone be preserved and then let the new iPhone come unto me. This is yoga shema. This is basically what people are, are all about. Samsara is basically about this. That which I have, money and relations and youth and health and um, um, whatever is nice. Let it all stay. Let me not lose it. And whatever else I do not have yet, that new gadget, um, that new house or car or relationship or um, knowledge or degree or, or an award, whatever is, is my heart's desire, let it come to me. This is the nature of desire, yoga kshema. And he's telling you here to be a karma yogi, you must rise above that. You must rise above that. Your, your life should not be all about yoga and kshema. Let that come unto me and let this stay with me. Life should not be about that. That's not the point of life. A question that comes up here immediately. It might work for a sannyasi, a monk in the Himalayas. But what about me? Here I am in Manhattan. I have to, life is a struggle every day. I'm working hard from morning to evening, day after day, month after month. Who's going to pay the bills? If I give up you know, yoga, kshema, then how, will, how is life going to go on? Don't worry. It doesn't tell you that to give up your job or... It says that the purpose of life should not be that. Maintain yourself. Do what has to be done. But do it in this. We'll see how to do that. But not for the purpose of yoga kshema. And don't worry. Um, Sri Krishna will say later on in the Gita. Yoga kshema vaham myaham. For the person who pursues spiritual life. I will take care of that person's yoga kshema. What that person needs. Not greed. Need. What that person's person needs, I will supply. And whatever is needed to be protected, what, what the person uh, needs to hold on to or maintain, I will maintain it for that person. In the Bible, clearly it is said, um, uh, Jesus Christ says, think not, when he talks about renunciation, think not, what shall we wear, what shall we eat? And then the beautiful portion where he says, the, um, uh, the flowers of the field. Do they think what shall be wear? That uh, who is clothed more in even King Solomon in his all his glory was not clothed in such finery as the simple flowers of the field. The birds of the air. Do they think that what shall we eat tomorrow? So God provides for them, and for you, His beloved children. Will God not provide more? So uh, do not think like that. So in your yoga kshema. Uh, and Atmavan, be centered in awareness, mindful. I am that witness consciousness. I am Atman. Or if that does not appeal to you, then God, God exists. My chosen deity is in my heart. Let my mind be at, at the lotus feet of my chosen deity. Let my mind be on the mantra. Or in the path of, of knowledge, I am the witness consciousness, the Atman, which was taught in the first part of the second chapter. Atma one. The commentator says Apramattaha. Apram Pramada means error. There is a saying Pramada Vai Mrityu. Error or uh, inattentiveness. Carelessness. Yeah, carelessness is Pramada. Carelessness, error, inattentiveness is death in spiritual life. Be, uh, be mindful in spiritual life. It's a big thing now, mindfulness. So here you have Traigunya Vishaya Veda, lower portions of Veda, the ordinary religion is about material nature, material happiness in this world and the next. This Traigunya Bhava Arjuna, O oh Arjuna, time for you to rise above that. Then Nirdvandva, the dualities, waves, ups and downs of life will keep coming. Learn to ride those waves. Don't get swept away or dragged under them. Nitya Sattvastha. Your resource here is patience. A new word used in positive psychology, very beautiful word, is resilience. Somebody said, I want, I, I, I want to see how the ball bounces, not how high it bounces, but how it bounces when it hits rock bottom. So this ability to be patient, to hold on to spiritual life. 
in the midst of troubles in the midst of difficult circumstances nir yoga kshema and atma one nir yoga kshema there is a beautiful um story about it i thought i would spend 10 minutes on this verse i spent 30 All right just this story and then I'll move on <laughs> but this story must be told yoga I'll tell this again when it comes to that verse yoga kshema vaham vyaham i think that is 9th chapter 22nd verse yes yoga kshema vaham vyaham is 9th chapter 22nd verse there sri krishna says that one who is devoted to god one who is the spiritual seeker i take care of that person's yoga and kshema what that person needs i supply and what needs to be protected and maintained in that person's life i'll do it that person doesn't have to bother about his or her worldly affairs now the story is this i think the story about jagannath mishra probably a great pandit who was writing a commentary on the mahabharata uh, he was in puri in those days um i forget the name of the pandit anyway he was in puri in those days and he was writing a commentary on the mahabharata so mahabharata you know is the longest epic of humanity more than 100000 verses many times longer than the iliad and odyssey uh, odyssey combined so he is writing a commentary on that now the gita is a part of the mahabharata So when he comes to this verse of the Gita he has, has to write a commentary on the Gita also when he comes to this verse of the Gita the exact sanskrit meaning is whatever that person needs my devotee my lover whatever he needs i will carry that yoga kshema vahamyam i will bear it unto that person i will carry myself to that person vahami means really carrying on your shoulder on your head that's what it means now the scholar thought God will not carry things for a devotee. No, God will grant it to the devotee. So, vahami ham is not quite correct. Vahami means to ca- carry. Why should God carry things? It's uh, below below His uh, uh, glory, you know, His stature. So, what He did was He scratched it out, and He replaced it. The original word of the Gita that I sh- I carry unto them what they need. he scratched it out and he said i dadamya ham i grant unto them what they need and that befits the glory of god so krishna misspoke maybe he was emotional uh, but really god doesn't do that you know now that day his wife was at home and she was worried because they were poor and they didn't have enough food in the house and she was worried about what what they would cook and then this little boy comes a beautiful little boy carrying on his head a basket of the best delicacies so she is very happy who are you oh your husband has sent this um this is for your husband i bought it for for you and your husband uh then she said oh that, that's so sweet of you and um then she sees there is a um a stripe on the back of the boy like a red mark like somebody has whipped him with a cane or something and she asks oh my god who did this to you Uh, this is terrible so oh, your husband beat me i mean with a cane or something he caned me and she was shocked why would he do such a thing wait just just you wait until he comes uh, comes home i'll give him a piece of my mind and then the boy disappeared no no one knew where he went of course it was krishna the bad child krishna and when um the scholar comes home and sees a delicious feast but his wife is furious he said what did you do why did you hit that poor little child what do you mean i and what child i didn't meet any child no he came and he said i am bringing i am carrying for you the things you you need and uh, and but that that mark of the cane that that's um, that's what your husband did to me then he immediately was thunderstruck he said that's cut that stripe he has cut across the word dadamyaham that comes on the body of krishna uh, that that sri krishna feels so much that there is actually a uh, a mark of being whipped on, on his uh, on his back so immediately he 
corrected it again. So that's the story. God really does carry to the devotee what the devotee needs. Moving on, at last. Actually, my goal was the 47th verse. That's the central verse, one of the most famous verses of the Bhagavad Gita. So I wanted to spend today's time on that, but I, I will. Uh, let me quickly finish 46 and we'll move on to 47. 46. Yavan Artha Udapane Yavan Artha Udapane Sarvata Sampluto Dake Sarvata Sampluto Dake Tavan Sarve Shuve Deshu Tavan Sarve Shuve Deshu Brahmanasya Vijanata Brahmanasya Vijanata So to that Brahmin, by here Brahmin, it means not the Brahmin of, of a, the caste, but the enlightened one, the knower of Brahman. To that knower of Brahman, Vijanata, the one who knows, one who, has, who is the knower, the enlightened one. To that enlightened one, the Vedas, which deal with the three goodness, the lower portion of Vedas, are of as much use as is a little pond or a well when the flood waters are at high tide, when there is water everywhere. Why would you go to a small source of water, you know, tap for water to drink, maybe the well for um, water to take your bath, maybe the pond, imagine a village seen in India, maybe the pond to wash your clothes. Uh, why would you go to these little sources of water when everywhere there is water? Uh, the imagery is this. I remember in Chicago, there's a huge lake. Uh, it's Lake uh, Michigan. Lake Michigan. It's enormous. And it goes on for miles and miles uh, both ways. So, flood waters are a lake like that. An enormous lake. When you have something like that, that can supply all your wants. And there is much more left over after that. You can drink water there, you can go for a swim there, you can uh, bathe there, you can use it for irrigating your fields and so and so forth. Whatever you want is supplied by that vast expanse of water. You don't have to go to specific little sources of water, which may run dry at any time. You don't have to make the effort. It's effortlessly available. What does this mean? It means all these thousand and one things we try to do in life to get satisfaction and happiness, all of them are unnecessary are far exceeded when you become enlightened, when you get God. The God realization, all of our needs are met and fulfilled forever. By that one thing. It's not that, see, you need to earn money to pay for your rent, you need to go to college to get a degree, um, you need to get married and for children, uh, you need to go take them to school for their education, uh, you need to jog in the park for your health. So many different activities to get different kinds of satisfaction. And all of those things are meant for what? All of them are meant for fulfillment. Whether it is... Um, relationships or money or um, uh, education, all of them, the happiness they give, it is fulfilling. It, is, it, it satisfies this deep lack of contentment in my heart. It gives me some kind of, I, I feel I'll be happy if I get those things. But I never do. None of them. All of them put together till today. The richest man, the one who has won, who got a Nobel Prize, the one uh, who has been married many times and has got the largest number of children, the one who has performed the greatest number of uh, religious rituals, all of them put together. None of them can claim, I am fully happy and satisfied. Nobody. None of them. And yet, there is something by attainment of which all our desires are satisfied forever, fulfilled forever. There's nothing more to be gained. The Gita will say later, attaining which nothing higher remains to be attained. Being established in which the greatest of sorrows cannot shake you. The greatest of sorrows cannot shake you. Being the 
house built on a rock it cannot be shaken when the winds blow and on so on so forth it will not be shaken so getting which nothing higher remains to be um, uh, achieved and established in which the greatest of sorrows cannot shake us you might ask just a minute god realization does it mean it's like all my christmas uh, all my christmas wish lists will be fulfilled whatever i wanted in life the 1 2 3 4 5 6 you know does it mean uh, all my education needs my financial needs my relationship needs all those things will be fulfilled no what it means is the reason why i am doing that the reason why i am running to those sources and uh, those small sources of water the thirst which drives me to to those four small sources of water that thirst is quenched forever i am not uh, seeking satisfaction in those things anymore A deep satisfaction ensues where you feel complete and forever so it's it's an incredible thing that is called freedom that is called moksha that is called god realization salvation no fear anymore no fear of death no fear of anything in fact in the upanishads when the emperor janaka the emperor attains enlightenment his guru says he doesn't say that you have attained enlightenment the guru says abhayang vai prapto si janaka o janaka o emperor you have attained fearlessness you have attained fearlessness so that is that is that vast lake god self realization brahman whatever you call it moksha nirvana is the vast lake reaching which you no longer need the little sources of water anymore which are provided by the vedas or by worldly means that's the meaning yes now we are ready to move on to the point of all of this wonderful so how do i do it what is karma yoga what is the secret what is to be done verse number 47 In fact it's one of the most famous verses of the Bhagavad Gita maybe the most famous verse sometimes if you if one verse people remember uh, in the Bhagavad Gita it's this one you might remember i mentioned the 16th verse nasato vidyate bhav as being important yeah it is important it is philosophically very important it's very important for non dualism but this verse is uh, universal in its appeal and that verse is not unique to gita or, or krishna because you find that teaching Uh, in in the upanishads for example but this is the unique way in which krishna has put it in this verse the teaching of karma yoga so what is that verse and what does it mean karmanyevadhikaraste karmanyevadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phalahe turbhu मा कर्म फल हे तुर्भु माते संगोस्वकर्मणि माते संगोस्वकर्मणि वेरी एलिगेंट वर्ड्स इन विच ही गिव्स द सेंट्रल टीचिंग ऑफ कर्म योग यू हैव द राइट टू वर्क यू डू नॉट हैव द राइट टू द रिजल्ट्स ऑफ वर्क डू नॉट वर्क फॉर फॉर गेटिंग द रिजल्ट्स द फ्रूट्स ऑफ वर्क and do not give up work either so four things he has said you have the right to work to action second you do not have the right to the results third do not do things for getting results getting something out of them so fourth do not give up action for that for that reason either okay now i had written down there so many things to be said yet so i thought in a, i shouldn't miss so i had written down and i got the notes note here two things karma and phalam work and results action and its fruits there are two things here to notice to be a karma yogi you must notice work and results these are the two things mentioned here the law of karma which was a sort of standard belief system then and um, among all indian systems of thought is that there is causality Act, uh, causes have consequences causality means causes have consequences and a belief in causality is universal what is the nature of causality philosophers and even scientists are debating till today but as automatic belief in causality is universal that's how we function in life even uh, some of the higher animals clearly define clearly demonstrate an understanding of causality 
So, cause and effect. The law of karma, or the doctrine of karma, runs thus. Good action, deliberately done, ethical action, leads to merit, and the result of merit is happiness, is some pleasant occurrence in life. In Sanskrit, dharma leads to punyam, punyam leads to sukham. So dharma, consciously done meritorious action, consciously done ethical action. Um, Punya, it generates a merit. And that merit will give you a result in this lifetime or next lifetime. Good things, nice things will happen to you. The opposite, adharma, consciously done unethical action, which I know to be wrong and yet I do it. Why do I do it? Because I can't restrain myself. Uh, Either greed or lust or anger tempts me and I overstep the bounds of decency, common sense, morality and I do something wrong. And that generates papa. Papa means uh, demerit or sin. And the result of the demerit is dukkham, suffering. In this life or next. So the law can be stated or the doctrine can be stated in this way. Dharma, punya, sukham. Adharma, papam, dukkham. Now, what we are experiencing in our life, the body I have got, the health I have got, the good and bad things happening to me in my life in terms of material prosperity, success in life, uh, people around me, the way my life is going, my own physical endowments and what is happening in life to me, all of it is the result of my past karma. The playground has been set. How I play, there is some amount of freedom there. But the playground has been set for me. Now, this is basically the law of karma. Notice something here. We have choice regarding karma action. We do not have choice regarding the result. It's an important principle to think about. What has been done will give results now. We only have to experience, enjoy or suffer the results of our past actions. Causes have been set in motion by us. But the consequences are now are unavoidable. As Vivekananda said, good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. This is samsara, this is law of karma. So they're going to come. They are coming all the time. We have no choice there. But what we have a choice is, we can exercise our willpower to do what we're going to do now, dharma or adharma, consciously done ethical or unethical action. This implies we have free will. Yes. I know we have long discussions about this. And Sri Ramakrishna, for example, in the gospel says we have no free will, only God has free will. And all the religions ultimately, theistic religions will say ultimately God's will is done. But at the same time, strangely, it seems contradictory. All religions, they teach free will and they have to believe in free will. Otherwise, who is going to follow religion? If only I have a choice to do this and not do that, then only I will listen to your do's and don'ts. If I have no choice in the matter at all, why should I listen to you? If I am a robot, if I am pre-programmed, if predestined, if everything is predestined, or under the control of a divine dictator, then what? why tell me? Tell the big guy up there. No. All religions, Christianity, it's a, the doctrine of free will is a very important part of Christian theology. Central part. In Hinduism also, Vedanta also. Um, it may be even an appearance of free will, an illusion of free will, but we have free will for the practical purposes. You, you feel that you have free will and you must act accordingly. Civilization is b- based on the belief of free will. Law and justice functions on the basis of free will. It's only when the, the person charged with a crime, only when you attribute free will to that person, he, he could have done it this way or he may not have, he need not have done it that way. He did something bad when he need not have done that, then only is punishable. If there's no choice except to do that bad thing, then how can you punish a person? But no. That's why please like insanity plea and all because, because of reasons of insanity, the person did something bad. Uh, that means underlying it is that person did not have free will or full play of free will. Free will is there. As far as our karma is concerned, free will is there. 
Another point, this is possible for human birth, for human beings. This is a thing which is mentioned in, the, in Vedanta again and again. It's only in the human birth that this choice regarding uh, action. Where is the choice? Action. Where is there is no choice? Result of action. Karma, choice. Karma phala, no choice. Fruit of action, no choice. In human birth, we have a choice regarding our action. To do or not to do. And no choice regarding the result of the action. Even there in the result of the action, it's not true that we have no choice. We have some choice in the future result of our actions. Because depending on the action that we do. So some choice is there. But animal birth, lower and higher animals, they have no choice in karma and the result of action. What they do is instinctive. And what they experience is also the result of the past karma. So in animal bodies, when the jiva, the sentient being, gets an animal body, the, it only experiences the results of past karma, exhausts its bad past karma, and uh, then goes on to a human birth again. So that's an important point. Animals are not credited with free will, uh, are not supposed to have free will. And uh, though I know most people treat their dogs as if they have free will. Hmm? You're saying, good boy, bad boy. <laughs> and so, and you get the feeling that the dog does have free will sometimes. Yeah? When they do something bad, you look at it, they look very guilty. <laughs> but in general, animals, the uh, principle is that they are instinctive. One uh, minor point here, Ram Sukhdas Ji mentions in his Hindi commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, he says a grammatical point. Notice that we do so many karmas, so many actions throughout the day. But the word used here is karmani. It's in, the, in Sanskrit grammar, in the singular. Um, karmani would be pl pl uh, plural. But karmani is singular. Yeah, in, you have f freedom in the action. Now he says, the commentator says, it just points out one thing. One of the important principles of karma yoga, that is focus. Do one thing at a time and do it wholeheartedly. Pour all your heart into it and then move on to the next. Swami Vivekananda said that empty the bucket. When you fill in something, do it and then let it go and then go on to something else. This is, this is one of the secrets of work is concentration, focus. God does not want you to do too many things, multitasking. No. Take up one thing, do it well and then move on. That's a minor point. I don't know how justified he is, but he sees, the, sees a point in the use of the singular case. All right. This verse tells us the secret of karma yoga. What is karma yoga? Karma yoga is this. There are three possibilities here. No action, giving up action, inaction. We do not want that. That is laziness, that is tamas. And there is action with desire, prompted by desire, which is what we see all around. People are doing things because there is something they want. Karma, action prompted by desire, that is born of rajas, rajasic. And then there is sattvic, karma without any selfish desire. I'm using the word selfish desire. There might be a desire for God realization. There might be a desire for the welfare of everybody. Altruistic work done. For the, truly done for the welfare of others, without any personal self-seeking. So that is sattvic. The sattvic. And karma yoga is the third one, the sattvic one. I'll repeat again, no action is one option, action prompted by desire is the second option, and action without desire, very active, but calm and desireless. The mind is, mind is not turbulent, Usually turbulence is because of desire, not for anything else. <coughs> there is a Hindi couplet. It means this, that I have given thee what is thine. Where is my expense in that? This body, my life, my mind, all my powers, all belong to thee, my Lord. So when I use them in thy service, I'm not spending anything out of my pocket. It, it belongs to you. I'm just giving it back to you. So in Hindi it goes, Tera tujko diya, kya lage more? <laughs> so, and that is the 
third option that is karma yoga now notice one thing if one goes into inaction then tamas increases tamaguna increases and one gets attached to laziness inertia dullness and that is very damaging for spiritual life if one engages in action prompted by desire that's the worldly kind of action that binds that binds more karma more results and more you are bound in um, happiness and misery the third one action done without desire one, one one is doing one's duty for the welfare of others as a worship of god that does not bind because there is no egotism involved there is no personal desire involved there so tamasic action or no action destructive of spiritual life rajasic action produces bondage satvic action produces freedom about rajasic action and tamasic action i have mentioned earlier the story of how sister nivedita going with swami vivekananda that when they reach india for the first time and from the ship sister nivedita sees the western coast i don't know if it's mumbai or something of india and she says uh, oh swami how peaceful and she had this ideal picture of india in her mind as a spirit, spiritual country um swami vivekananda scolded her she said no it is not peace it is the peace of the tomb it, it is the peace of the grave he said is the peace of the grave people are hungry under the dominion of a foreign power they are illiterate superstitious this is not peace so one must move out of this is tamas i was just thinking today that if today sister nivedita reaches mumbai she would say oh swami how busy <laughs> the whole place is maddeningly busy now that is rajas even that is not karma yoga that is rajas uh that binds and beyond that is satvik connection to tamas destructive of spiritual life connection to ra- uh, a rajasic mindset produces bondage and a satvik mindset leads to freedom only one thing one slight subtle point to mentioned here even in satvik action there is something to be noticed that satvik mindset produces knowledge a sense of freedom peace serenity light this is gitas will say it later from sattva these things come and this will also bind you so even to goodness one must have detachment from that you must remain serene satvik a pure desireless action but at the same time don't be attached to the fruits of that particular mindset which are uh, peace and serenity otherwise what happens is the moment that peace and serenity are disturbed oh uh, I, how do i recover that you're trapped again in the mind you are the atman why are you so worried about the peace and serenity of the mind so one must not be attached to even sattva sattva also one should not be attached to the re- or to put it in our, our language the results of spiritual practice there are some practical benefits one must not be attached to that also they will come certainly you will be calm certainly you will be have a sense of freedom and lightness very good but don't do it for that sake for the sake of that the story of the three dacoits the man got lost in the forest sri ramakrishna story the man got lost in the forest three robbers caught hold of him the first one who is thomas he said let's kill him the second one said no no why kill him uh, let's just bind him to a tree and they are robbers they've robbed him of everything the third one who is sattva uh, took pity upon him and said oh um you have suffered so much let me free you opens the uh, it l- sets sets him loose from the ropes and guides him shows him the way take that path you will go back to your hometown and that man is so grateful you come and come with me to my house you treated me so well and sat- the robber says no i cannot go with you there because i am a guna that means i am also a robber i can't go into the city which what it means is the three gunas sattva rajas and tamas are also part of material nature jada prakriti they are not spiritual ultimately but one must proceed from darkness and inertia to activity through activity through dynamism and activity to serenity and peace but beyond that also these are still in the mind 
You must, you must realize the self which transcends the mind. Um, then, all right, I, I give up. I can't finish it today. <laughs> Let me just make a couple of more points. So Swami Vivekananda says, what we want is disinterested action. That means action which in, in a serene and calm mind, not action born of desire and not inaction either. I remember this uh, monk many, many years ago, about 20 years ago. I was a novice. This senior Swami was in Delhi. He answered this fundamental question we all have when we come to Karma Yoga. How can you act without any motive? Without any selfish motive, how can you do something? And the Swami said, remember, I asked him the question. He didn't answer. I I walked with him to the temple. After evening prayers, I again walked him back to his room. As he was entering his room, he closed the doors. Just before closing the doors. Till that point, he had not answered. I thought he had forgotten the question. Just before closing the door. I can never forget that. He looks at me piercingly. He had a huge face. (laughs) He looks at me piercingly and he says, Remember my boy, disinterested action, not uninterested action. And then he closed the door. The two words in in the English dictionary, disinterested and uninterested. Uninterested is, is, I don't care. I'm not gaining anything out of it, so whatever happens, I don't care. It's nothing to do to me. Disinterested means I do not have any selfish motive in it. You know the word interested party, which means a party which has some motive, something to gain out of it. Axe to grind, that's the phrase. I have no personal axe to grind in this. I do not have a selfish motive involved in this. So he said, disinterested action, my boy, not uninterested action. One more point and I'm done. Human birth is for liberation. In this human birth, we have a choice about doing karma, what karma we can do. So these two things which I mentioned, karma and the result of karma, use them for liberation. How? This choice we have, this free will we seem to have in doing work, use this, this body, this sensory system, mind, speech, use them for the welfare of others for as a service to God without any selfish motive. Selfish means this body-mind. This body-mind for the glorification of this little individual. I am not this individual. Jnana Yoga has showed it to me. I am an infinite awareness existence place. So why should I work? It's like you get a car, a nice car. And then slowly taking care of the car becomes the point of your life. No, it's not. You have to maintain the car, but it's supposed to work for you. You existed before the car, now you are still there, and one day you'll still be there, the car won't be there. The body-mind is like that. So, it is meant for liberation. Human birth is meant for God-realization, salvation, moksha, nirvana, whatever you call it. The highest pursuit, ultimate goal of human life is God-realization. How will you do that in karma yoga? These two things. You have choice regarding karma. So do unselfish work, do karma yoga, use this body-mind system as an offering to God. I don't want anything from it. Let, let my actions be for the, for the welfare of, humanity is a big word, for people around me. And, or, and also as a worship of God. And the, the results of action, karma phala. These are the two things, action and result of action. Action, use it for wealth, for uh, as karma yoga. And the result of action, which we, are, we have no choice, when it is coming to us, let our attitude be spiritual. When the results are good and pleasant, let me use that occasion for doing good to others. Let me share the joy and be a blessing unto others. When the results of action are unpleasant, There's illness, people criticize me, um, loneliness, old age, disease, decay, death is facing me. Unpleasant. It is coming to me. Let me have a spiritual attitude there. I will hold on to God and ride out the the waves which are coming in in life. I am not bothered by that. Attitude will be fortitude. I will bear it. Let me see, see it through.
I'm holding on to the greatest power in the universe. What, can, what harm can come to me? Not, alas, I worshipped God. Why is this happening to me? Life is terrible. No, it, it happens like that. Will I, will I get cured? Uh, will things be all right for me? No, no, don't bother about that. Take the heroic attitude. All this is consequence of causes set by me in past lives. If I want to overcome this chain of cause and effect, I must put up with this. Put up with this as a spiritual practice. One great teacher, he said, Prarabdha karma, that means my accumulated karma which is giving results in this life. Whatever is happening to me is because of that. Use it as an offering to God. Not just bear with it. That sounds very stoic and painful and, and uh, boring. Just as you offer a, a, a tray of flowers to God, similarly offer this tray of misery or suffering or happiness, whatever is coming as a series of results of my past karma, mentally offer it to God. By my karma phala, I am worshipping thee. Hmm. When bad karma comes, have this, this attitude. Three things to remember. How to deal with suffering. Remember it is the result of my bad karma. Three things will help. One is, my bad karma is being burnt up by suffering. This suffering, it's good ultimately. Because all, all, the, all that I have, something that I must have done in the, in the past, that is being exhausted now. The opposite works for having a good time. When you're partying hard, remember all, all the good karma is being used up. Is it worth it? So, <laughs> bad karma is being burnt up by suffering. One. Second, it serves as a warning that I must be careful about my action, thought, word and deed. If I'm suffering today, I don't know for what, for something. I should be careful now. Let it all thought, word and deed be directed towards God-realization, be directed towards unselfish action, karma yoga. Third thing to remember is, bad karma, suffering is an occasion to remember God. It's easy to remember God when one is suffering, one, one is, is struggling, one, is, one feels helpless and alone and abandoned. Holy Mother says, when you have nobody, remember you have a mother. But when you feel that you have nobody, it's easy to, we, or when we are in trouble, the first thing we do is try to seek human help. You say, I believe in God, I pray to God. The moment there's a trouble, immediately I try to get help from others. That's all right. But the first thing you should run to is God. This has happened. Give me the courage to bear with it. You take care of it. There's nothing wrong in praying to God, solve it. We all want it to be solved. We are scared of trouble. But even if it is not solved, give me the strength to bear with it. Let me overcome this. Kunti, the mother of the Pandavas, her great prayer to Krishna was, I don't pray for happiness. Even for liberation, I don't even know what that is. But, O oh Krishna, grant me this, that, that um, in ages to come, if I am born again and again, let that be so. But let me have suffering. Why? So that I may remember thee. We pray for happiness. She prays for suffering. <laughs> uh, so, so that I may remember the suffering is, is uh, in one sense, it's a blessing because you remember that. Then that the only support is God. Hmm. All right. I've done about half of what I wanted to say about this verse. We'll pick, uh, pick it up next time. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu Devotion to God, one very important thing, it wipes out the results of past karma. If you do something for God, the results are not tenfold, a thousandfold. If you do good karma, you will get a good result back. If you do something unselfishly as a worship of God, not for getting something bad, it's enormous. It wipes out past karma. There's a beautiful story about this. When the, the avatar, Ramachandra, when he's going to uh, exile in the forest 
with Sita and Lakshman. And they come to the river, Gandaka, I think, where, I think, who is the Guhaka? Guhaka, the boatman. The boatman is there. So there's a nice song about this. Uh, when he comes to the boatman, the boatman recognizes that this is none other than the Lord in, in this form, in the form of the prince of Ayodhya, in the form of Rama. And today he has come to my shores. So the prince comes, uh, Rama comes and tells the poor boatman, will you take me across? And Guhaka says, yes, of course. And there's a, the, the, you know, the, those who tell the stories of Rama, they'll spin it out. I'm not extending the story. They will, the story itself will take half an hour to tell. <laughs> There'll be songs in between and things like that. <laughs> but it, it goes like this. They go into the, um, the um, river, um, like, you know, he carries Rama into the boat. And Rama says, why? I can walk into the boat. And he says, no, no, no. The touch of your feet uh, turned a uh, um, uh, stone into a woman. The story of Ahalya was, if your touch of your feet turns my boat into a woman, then I'll be lost. That is my only <laughs> source of... But the way he's... All the stories are like he's, he knows who you are. I know who you are. He washes the feet. So the dust of your feet should not touch the boat. And uh, yeah, that's right. And then they go into the uh, river and then he, he circles around, does not cross straight away. And Rama is surprised, why aren't you, why are you taking so much time? Why are you circling around? He said, how many lifetimes you have made me go round and round? <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, payback time. <laughs> Let me have your company. And, and so on, there are many, there are many little sub-stories there, um, but I'm not going into that. But the point I'm going into is this. He does a service to God. Now when, he, when they go to the other shore, Rama wants to pay him for his service, the boat fare. And he says, no, I will not accept anything from you. Why I will not charge you? Because we belong to the same trade. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, you know, custom among people in the same trade. We don't charge people in the same business. So, the prince, he says, I'm a prince. You are a boatman. How can we be in the same trade. Rama knows everything, of course, but he's playing the game. So how can we, how are we in the same trade? And then Guhaka says, I'm a boatman. I take people across this little river. You are a boatman too. You take people across the ocean of life. <laughs> and then he says, that today I did not charge you. Remember, when I come to your shores, you shouldn't charge me too. <laughs> I want free passage. <laughs> Come to your shore means on the point of death. You should take me across.